Uh, my name is Brian Polito. Uh, I'm the lead architect for a product called IBM Voice Agent with Watson, uh, which is part of a platform for building voice bots that are connected to, to uh, telephony contact centers. And I'm here to talk about voice bot architectures, really in the context of telephony and, and contact centers. Uh, there's lots of topics around voice bots, so I'm going to kind of focus on that. So in terms of customer service today, um, call, there's, you know, the call center challenges are the same as they've been for a long time. Uh, improve customer satisfaction uh, while also reducing the cost of the contact center. Contact centers are very expensive to run. Uh, live agents, uh, uh, very expensive, right? It can be anywhere from 6 to $10 a phone call every time you talk to a live agent. And because of those, uh, those challenges, um, you know, it's, it can be uh, really important to, to look at modernization of that contact center. So there's some advances going on uh, that, that are having an effect on contact centers. Uh, basically, the, the, uh, de the development of chatbots, uh, everybody that's used a web browser has probably interacted with uh, a bot through, through, uh, through chat. Uh, and then you have the hyper adoption of voice interfaces through Alexa and, and, and Siri. So uh, all these things are kind of coming together to, uh, to kind of drive voice bots. And I, I'm going to kind of take a step back and just talk about Cognitive Contact Center uh, because we, we kind of have a view of this that, uh, you know, in terms of the differences between them, a traditional contact center, you know, obviously IVR driven, uh, I, would, I would say that's more around directed dialogues, DTMF driven, uh, where voice bots are more uh, open dialogue, voice driven. Uh, voice XML uh, is used to typically program traditional IVRs. Uh, co cognitive contact centers, you get into things like NLU, uh, of course, you still have dialogue, programming, things like that, but there's a lot more around uh, natural language. Um, MRCP-based speech servers versus cloud speech service services. Um, you know, with Google, Watson have speech services that are accessed through, through WebSockets. Uh, live agents, AI-assisted live agents, you saw a discussion earlier uh, on paralinguistics and, and speech analytics, so that there, there's a lot going on there. Uh, grammars versus custom language models. Since the dialogues are more open-ended, uh, it's, it's a little harder to drive the conversation sometimes with, with grammar. But keep in mind that everything on the left side of this also applies on the right. So all those tools still can apply on the right. It's just there's a lot of new stuff coming. Uh, things like uh, AI-infused KPIs versus more traditional KPIs in the call center. Um, so I'm not going to go through all those. but. So, so what is a voice bot? Um, in the context of contact center, voice bots are automated agents that interact with humans using natural language and speech in real time. And I'm, I'm breaking this down into two parts, really. Uh, what I'm calling the cognitive IVR, uh, which is very similar in some ways to traditional IVR, but it, it's, it includes quite a bit more in terms of uh, AI, uh, orchestrating AI services. Um, handling uh, AI-infused KPIs, things like that. It also is the interface to the telephone network. And then in terms of AI services themselves, you, you have the ASR and uh, speech-to-text, text-to-speech. Uh, you have NLP, NLU uh, engaging with customers um, and, and callers. And then you have uh, uh, extracting caller temperament using tone analysis and sentiment, things like that. So. Um, I'm going to kind of dive into both of those areas. So uh, just an example of a customer engagement uh, with a cognitive contact center. So, you know, not much different than calling in to a uh, typical IVR. A caller calls in, the call gets routed to a voice bot, and that bot will start communicating with the caller. And right away, the caller kind of feels like something's a little bit different going on here. The, the, the voice sounds a bit more human, even though it might still feel automated. It sounds like something's a little different. And it, it's, you, the caller can, can start asking questions in, in a more natural, uh, conversational manner. And then on top of that, um, you might get more rich sort of uh, information and, along with that voice conversation. Uh, for instance, with our product, we support SMS integration. And, and you can do things with SMS that you can't do with voice. So com kind of combining all those things is, is a, uh, a way to advance this technology. 
But you know, a lot of times a voice bot will get to the point where it can't handle the call, transfers out, and then at that point, uh, we, we, we support this ability to fork media uh, out to, to, I'm still calling it a voice bot platform. At this point, it's more of a speech analytics platform, but it's capturing uh, the real time streaming from both the caller and the live agent. Those are separate streams coming in to, to the platform and we can run real time transcriptions on that and eventually surface information back to the live agent in real time that can help them more quickly answer questions and, and, and solve problems faster. So the cognitive IVR itself orchestrates a set of AI services, typically speech to text, text to speech, and some kind of chat bot. Uh, these, these platforms are built really more with chat bots than, than traditional uh, voice XML driven interactions. Um, it also is an interface to the telephone network and it's generating all kinds of content uh, uh, that you can, you can run post call analytics around to, to improve your bot over time. Um, and this cognitive IVR really sits between the caller and these services that are being orchestrated. And I'm going to walk through just a typical flow. This is what we call a conversation turn, where the caller calls in, asks a question, and, and kind of walk you through that process. So the question comes in, streamed in over RTP. Uh, the question is streamed to speech to text, and we get a text utterance back. And that text utterance is kind of delineated on when the, speaker, when the caller stops speaking. Uh, that text utterance is forwarded to the chatbot framework. That could be something like Watson Assistant or Google Dialogflow. Uh, a response comes back, and that response is in text form. It gets forwarded to the text-to-speech engine. Uh, that, that text gets synthesized into audio, and then finally streamed back to the caller. And this happens over and over and over again in the context of a conversation. Now, this cognitive IVR really does a lot more than that. It's dealing with barge in, it deals with transfer, transcoding a lot of times to the different speech engines, switching custom language models within the call, call flow, dealing with grammars. It's orchestrating all this stuff. So to drill down on the AI services a little bit, so speech to text I've already talked about, text to speech, uh, natural language classification. This is really where, uh, where uh, the AI comes into play, where you're training uh, this, this bot on intents and those intents get mapped to responses from the bot. And then, you know, beyond that, you can still do dialogue flow, which is not really an AI service, but it's still important when you're, once you figure out what the intent is to, to direct them through the, the discussion. And then you get into sentiment and tone, which I, I think over time is going to become really important and because you want the voice bot to really be empathetic to the caller and be able to respond to the caller in a way that's uh, feels natural to, to whoever's speaking with it, because you really, the whole idea is to keep them contained in the system and let the bot complete the interaction without having to go out to the live agent. Um, deep search, I, I'm, I'm not going to get into it too much, but um, long tail responses where, uh, you know, these are the, the, 5% of the questions you get are maybe uh, not what you've trained your, your intent models around, but, but you, you've got a lot of unstructured data that you can pull from to maybe get a response back to the caller to help them. Uh, in terms of, so this is a pretty busy chart, but it shows all the different interfaces involved here. On the left side, you have SIP, RTP. It's really the, the voice interface to the telephony side. Um, there's a lot going on there, a lot of different protocols. Uh, on the bottom, you have the speech services. And typically, you know, traditionally MRCP was the protocol used to communicate with these services, but WebSockets is kind of emerging as the, the, new, the new player on the block there. Um, on the right side, you have a lot of the transactionally driven AI services. Basically, this is an utterance in. Uh, you might attach a lot of data to that response that's coming back, uh, sentiment, tone, things like that, but that's a, basically a REST-based interaction. And then on top, it's all this, this extra information that are, is being generated from the, from the, from the call. Uh, everything from call recordings to the call detail records that are infused with confidence scores from the speech engine and from the intent mapping and, and opt-outs. Where, where did the caller opt out of the call, for instance? That's really important when you're trying to evolve your bot over time and, and improve it. And then that information feeds into analytics. Um, there's a lot of post-call analytics that, that can be pulled from this information. Uh, and there's a feedback loop back into the AI engine to retrain it around, uh, around the problem areas the bot's having. 
Uh, just a, a network diagram, I wanted to show this because uh, the patterns that we support, there's typically a, a, a custom uh, service orchestration engine that sits between the cognitive IVR and, the, and these AI services. That's basically receiving the text utterance in. It can modify that utterance before it goes to the AI service and it gets the response back and can then modify it again. It can add account information, uh, you know, account balances. It can call out to third-party APIs. Um, this can be done either, you know, with Watson Assistant, for instance, we support OpenWhisk. You can call out using serverless APIs or you can just embed this proxy using Node or, or Java, you know, a Java application server that sits between the cognitive IVR and, and the AI services. Okay. So challenges, uh, lots of challenges when building a voice bot. Most of them start with speech to text because the bot's really only as good as, as the accuracy of the transcription. Um, and I call out some of the specific areas that, that, that can be problematic, certainly dialects, uh, language support, all that is really bu built around uh, acoustic model training. Uh, transcribing domain-specific speech, acronyms, things like that that, that uh, most base models in a speech engine aren't going to understand. You have to have the, the APIs and, and tools to do that training. Uh, Single-syllable words, especially like alphanumeric strings where, where somebody's trying to spell something. Uh, spelling is really hard for, for, for speech engines. And, uh, you know, acoustic model training and grammars can help with that. If the speech engine knows that somebody's about to spell something, you can, it, it, you can narrow down the focus of the engine to, uh, to get good results. Uh, noise filtering, obviously, there's, there's problems when you're in noisy environments. Bots need a way to kind of figure out what, what's being, uh, what's actually from the caller, what's background noise. Voice authentication. We support two-factor authentication using SMS. Uh, there's voice biometric technology out there that, that can basically take a fingerprint of a voice and, and use that to, to authenticate a caller. Um, those are becoming more and more popular. And then just delineating the utterances. You know, you'd be surprised how difficult that can be uh, to get right. And you have to be able to control that sometimes between every turn in the conversation. Sometimes you need a longer amount of silence at the end of the utterance to give people a time to pause as they're reading a long number, for instance. So in terms of text-to-speech, you know, the thing we hear the most is it has to sound human. We want it to sound human. You know, it's, it's incredible that, you know, uh, Google WaveNet put out this demo a while back. I'm sure probably everybody in here has seen it where, um, you know, the, the bot sounded incredibly human. There was a lot of imperfection in the, re in the responses coming from the bot, and, and it set the bar almost unrealistically high, <laughs> to be honest. But uh, you can use SSML to, to, to change a lot about the, the phrasing of the response. So uh, there's a lot of interesting research going on in this area, and I think you'll see it get better and better. Uh, latency, you know, anytime you can cache the, the, the synthesized audio, it helps. Uh, and then certainly matching dialects, you can kind of slow speech down. If, if the bot's talking to someone from the South, for instance, versus someone from New York, you might change the speed of the, of the way the bot's responding. On the NLU side, uh, you know, when people talk to bots, they, you know, I'll give an example. If somebody calls in and orders a pizza, sometimes they might say, I want a large pizza and wait for a question. You know, what do you want on that large pizza? And sometimes they might say, I want a large pizza with pepperoni and I want it to be thick crusted. And those kind of responses, you have to be able to handle either of those responses and kind of fill in the information as it comes. And with Watson Assistant, we support slots for doing that kind of thing. I'm sure Google probably has something similar, but that, that's, that's really important. Intent training um, can be time consuming. We, use, uh, we're, we provide a lot of pre-trained intents uh, with our product, but um, training is really important. Uh, converting chatbots to voice. I just wanted to mention that one because a lot of people think you can take a chatbot and just put voice in front of it, and from our experience, it just doesn't work at all. You really have to separate out the chatbot and, and change. It's a much more conversational flow. Uh, a lot of times there's tagging uh, in the responses from chatbots with HTML and all kinds of stuff that has to be filtered out. Um, and then I've already talked about integration with systems of record. Evolution of the bot. 
probably the most important thing that, to take away from all this is that you know when you deploy a voice bot, that's just the beginning. You know, voice bots are really dumb, and they need to be evolved over time. And uh, I list some of the data that, that we try to collect to, to help with that evolution. Um, Human intervention is critical here. I think it's kind of a myth that you can have this, this feedback system where it's going to learn on its own. It's just like a kid. It needs a teacher, and a human is the teacher in this case. And, and the human is basically using all this data uh, to, to try to identify where the bot's going south, you, you know, which nodes most typically get opted out of and cause a transfer, where are all the barge ends happening. Um, you know, it, it, is the accuracy or my word error rates, you know, are causing problems in the bot. So all this stuff can be used to feed the training back into the system over time. So you really need the data and you need the tools to do that. So uh, this is the end. Uh, if you want to demo real quick, you can, there's a number here you can call. This was all built using IBM Voice Agent with Watson. Uh, there's a link with, for more information. But um, you know, this stuff's happening today. And, and uh, you know, what we see is that uh, you know, if, if your competitor is, is putting voice bot technology out there and it's helping people get their questions answered more quickly, um, that's a huge advantage. And, it, and it, it really has a lot to do with customer adoption and keeping them with your company. So that's it. Any questions? Great. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Any questions yep. for Brian? Thanks.